recognizing and acknowledgement of country before I hand over to Andrew to give a bit of an overview of Soundwalk September and then we'll go over to Tracy Cooper who is our host uh, for this session tonight. So um, I'd like to acknowledge all First Nation people who are joining us and also acknowledge that I'm meeting with you all from the Ngunnawal uh, country of the capital region of Australia uh, in Canberra. And I'd like to acknowledge all elders past, present and emerging and, um, and hope that everybody here has a really good time. And I will now hand over to Andrew. Thank you very much, Tracy. And um, just a very few, quick few words for me to say that this is a really exciting moment for us, Tracy reminded me earlier on that it was the equinox today so um, it's rather fabulous that we're having a, an event so early in the morning for us uh, here in the northern hemisphere so uh, uh, fantastic to see such a lineup of people and a lot of interest has been uh, sparked by this panel and I want to uh, really thank Tracy Benson for, for bringing these um, talented people together so um, a little more for me, but to say that Soundwalk September has been put together by a core group of uh, three volunteers. We're not a big team, but we've uh, drawn on lots of favours and um, uh, lots of fantastic people have been contributing uh, great events. And this, I'm sure, is going to be another one. So um, it wouldn't be uh, possible without some help uh, from sponsors. And we're very fortunate that we have a sponsor for this event. Um, so I'm just going to read you a little bit about the sponsor, and that's Sound Trails. Um, they're uh, based in Australia. They're a leading locative platform, and they work on commission with local councils, national parks, Aboriginal communities and arts groups, as well as leading producers who know how to create immersive sound experiences. Uh, their work is as timeless and grounded in real people and real places. Sound Trails will soon be starting overseas and they believe um, their up and coming version of their platform Sound Trails 2 will be one of the most integrated systems in the world. It's about compelling locative audio experiences and building a sustainable future for producers and artists. So they invite you to check them out at soundtrails.com.au. So over to you Tracy Cooper. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Trace. Welcome, everybody. What a beautiful lineup tonight. And of course, Tracy, uh, we met uh, during the Beyond Crisis webinar series, um, Michelle and April and I and the team there. And it was wonderful after that event to connect with this event and, and create this collabor collaboration. Um, we, we're all working together. And this time on the planet, there is so much more emphasis on collaboration because we've all been in this space for a long, long time. So it's wonderful to connect and it's a real honour on behalf of Beyond Crisis, the Valley Centre, all the organisations um, behind Beyond Crisis to welcome everybody. And I'm particularly moved by this theme, deep listening and the sacred, um, working with our First Nations for the last decade. And you go on country, that's what you do. You listen and it's deep and it's walking and it's sacred. So I'm very excited to hear all of you speak and welcome to everybody. It's great to be involved. It's going to be a wonderful event. Enjoy, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Tracy. Um, I think the running uh, order tonight, we'll, um, we'll have Joe Tito first uh, and then we'll have Leah Barclay, followed by uh, Ruth, um, Erwin and then Michelle Maloney and then we'll um, get into a, a bit of a conversation around the themes that we're exploring uh, for the panel and then we'll open the floor up to questions um, uh, for a, a, at least the last half an hour. So um, I will now hand over to Jo to talk about her amazing practice. Uh, Tēnā tātou, uh, ko Joe Tito tōku ingoa, he uri a hau no Taranaki no Te Arawa hoki, uh, ki te taho tōku pāpa, ko Taranaki te maunga, ko Waitotoroa te awa, ko Kura Haupo te waka, 
ko Taranaki te iwi, ko ngā simoia hu te hapu, ko Takitutu te marae, ko Pariaka te papakainga, ki te taho tōku māma, ko Matafaura te maunga, ko Rotoichi te moana, ko Te Arawate Waka, ko Ngāti Pikiao te iwi, ko Haumai te Tawhiti te papakainga. A, ko tēnei te mihiasu ki a koutou, ko hui hui mai nei i tēnei pō. I just want to um, say welcome and thank the organisers for having me a part of this panel. I've just um, talked about where I come from, the mountains that I come from. On my dad's side, I'm from Taranaki, which is on the west coast of the North Island um, of Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, a little settlement called Parihaka around the coast. Um, some of you may know about Parihaka. I'm also from Punihō, a little bit more further around the coast. And on my mum's side, I'm from Tiarawa in the Bay of Plenty, um, not far from Rotorua in the lakes area. So I acknowledge my uh, maunga, my rivers, um, my people where I come from. Um, this on the theme today, thinking about sacred, um, the sacred, our sacred connection um, and my art practice. My art practice began when I was growing up, I grew up with the bush as my playground. Um, and when I think to my artist journey from when I first started to now where I am, 26 years, well, of 26 years I've been an artist, but since a child until now, I've realized that I've come full circle in terms of my art practice and what I've been working with over the years. And that's been, um, focusing on nature. I'm a photographer, primarily a photographer. I started off being a photographer and I'm currently working on a project um, looking at the botanical dye potential of our native trees. So over the years, photography has been my, my foundation and my process of connecting with nature through light. And so, um, yeah, over the years it has, I've been on a bit of a journey and in terms of connection to um, who I am and where I come from is very much a part of my process. So a lot of the art that I do is about connecting to the whenua, connecting to the land and connecting to nature and looking at ways that I can express where I come from through through nature, through photography, through the art mediums that I'm working with. So, um, yeah, so it's interesting the journey that I've been on to become the artist that I've, be I've become today has been a journey of self-discovery and reconnection to who I am. When I moved home to Taranaki, it was through the learning of my language and reconnection to my whenua there in Taranaki that my creativity actually emerged from the whenua where I come from. So everything that I do, everything that is what I create is comes from the whenua and my whakapapa connections to where I come from. So it's hard to express how what that connection is when it is very much a part of who you are. It's it's something that just is, that just comes out that way, that is not, um, yeah, I can't really explain that connection that we have to the, the whenua and the environment that is already a part of um, who I am as, as an artist as well too. So, um, in terms of the things that I've done over the years, um, I've worked a lot with stone, worked a lot with, um, again, natural materials. Something that's been quite important for me, especially in the last 10 years, has been collaboration and working with other artists, which is how I come to be here on this panel as well. I've worked um, with Tracy in the past and Leah Barclay, who you also hear from as well, um, working with environmental issues, with water, um, again, back to the whenua, back to the earth, um, helping, helping others reconnect to 
the earth through creative practice. And so a lot of the work that I've done has been with water as well. Um, yeah, and my current project, which is going into um, 2021, is again creating with the botanical dyes of our native trees. So I've just finished the research part of my project and I'm now looking at creating artwork solely from our native trees here in Aotearoa, right from the canvas through to the dyes and the creative mediums that I'll be using on for the artworks as well too. So, um, so Harakeke is a flower that I use quite a bit in my practice. So it's one of our native trees. Um, Formentinex is its scientific name and it has become for the last 20 years one of the main materials in my art form that I've used both as a physical medium, um, emotionally, spiritually, as a um, as part of my practice as well and for the current works that I'm working on I'll be making flax paper from harakeke, so flax is harakeke, so I'll be making canvases from um, harakeke for my artworks using the botanical dyes but also harakeke for us in Taranaki is an important plant well all across Aotearoa but in Taranaki in particular it's a plant that grows plenty, very plentiful and it's where my journey with the plant began was in Taranaki growing the plant beneath our maunga um, and then growing it here at home I've been growing it in my garden for the last 10 years and using it as a creative medium uh, many, many people, it's a weaving plant as well. A lot of weavers use it for weaving, but I'm mainly a paper maker, so I'll use the plant for paper making, but I also use it as a gardener for mulch. It's also a very healing plant too, so it's um, all parts of the plant can be used for rongoa, for medicine, um, and also the plant for me is a, that the way it grows in a fan, it's a it representative of whānau, so it's a plant that um, for me has the whole philosophy of life and whānau and community in it, embedded in it too. So in my garden, it brings birds to the garden in summer, uh, spring, spring and summer. I also use the, the seed pods of the plant as well for dyes. Um, the flowers feed the birds, um, the, the plant is always, um, well photographed over the seasons as well. It's one of my plants in the garden that is a huge um, photographic inspiration for me. It's a creative medium and a creative inspiration too. So it's a really important plant, really important and Thanks, special. Jo. You've actually used up your time beautifully now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jo. I'll um, hand over now to Leah. Thank you, Tracy. Um, yeah, and thank you for the invitation to be here. It's great to see so many familiar faces um, on the panel and of course um, in the Zoom. I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country which I'm coming from you today. It's um, Gubby Gubby country. I'm on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia. And I thought what I would do is just give a kind of brief snapshot of the practice that I'm engaged with that has a specific focus on sound walking. As Andrew mentioned at the opening of the panel, I've, I've been lucky to be involved in several iterations of Soundwalk September, including back when it was Soundwalk Sunday. And a lot of those projects have revolved around locative media. So I'm gonna screen share and just kind of give you a snapshot. Yep. Um, so most of the work that I do is uh, all about really looking at what we can learn from listening to the environment and using sound as a tool and listening as a tool to reconnect communities to the environment. So most of my practice revolves around recording different ecosystems around the planet and then finding ways that we can kind of share those ecosystems as a way to connect people. So all of the work is really about listening and deep listening to the environment and this idea of sort of developing mobile phone apps and a locative media practice has been really embedded in the sort of work that I do but also creating live performances so as an example you know a site-specific performance on Mooloolaba Beach here on the Sunshine Coast where we streamed the sounds of the ocean 
um, into a geodesic surround sound dome and allowed the audience to be immersed in those soundscapes in real time. So from a, a sound walking and, and geolocative media perspective, um, I've been really passionate about the way that we can use mobile technologies to reconnect communities to the environment through sound walking. So for about 12 years now, I've been involved in a whole range of different apps from contributing content to existing apps, to assisting with the development of some apps to developing our own apps around specific projects. Biosphere Soundscapes, for example, was one of the first kind of sound walking apps I developed, which terrifying to think that's almost 10 years ago now. Um, and then more recently developing um, an app called Orality, which basically involved creating um, connection points up the entire coastline of Queensland with a particular focus on connecting communities to aquatic soundscapes. So from the sounds of the Great Barrier Reef to freshwater ecosystems. And this has all been about, you know, from an aquatic perspective, how we can really bring these sounds of um, environments we don't traditionally have access to or environments we don't traditionally think about and allow us to connect with these ecosystems by actually hearing those soundscapes in real time. So live hydrophones, underwater microphones in a river system that the apps can then pick up in real time or, for example, um, taking Times Square in New York City and mapping the Amazon rainforest over Times Square and then using these um, augmented reality applications to be able to trigger those soundscapes in real time. So you have this complete juxtaposition of being immersed in the soundscapes of the rainforest uh, while walking through Times Square in New York City. Um, so I guess for me, these soundscapes are not just um, artistic experiences in connecting these communities to the environment, but I'm also using all of this sound material that's built into these apps to contribute towards scientific research as well. So to monitor environmental change. And we're now at this point where sound or this field of ecoacoustics is one of the most accessible, affordable and non-invasive methods to monitor environmental change. And, you know, if we look at this image of the rainforest, you know, we can see absolutely nothing about what's actually happening in this ecosystem. And, you know, if we say an image is worth a thousand sorry, if a picture is worth a thousand words, you know, someone like Bernie Krauss would say a soundscape is worth a thousand pictures because we can now install these devices in an environment like this and be monitoring environmental change. And what's really exciting is this kind of technology has become, you know, so accessible and affordable, something like an audio moth, which costs just $25, can be installed throughout the rainforest, be monitoring environmental change, um, be managed directly within the context of communities and be contributing towards these arts and cultural projects that allow us to connect with these ecosystems in new ways. And so that's sort of the foundations of um, a number of the research projects that I lead, including Biosphere Soundscapes, which is all about kind of looking at the possibilities of acoustic ecology to understand environmental change, but also sound to really reconnect communities to the environment. And hydrophones are a huge part of that project. And they're, you know, really, again, like the smaller device I showed earlier, um, becoming so accessible that we now have devices that we can plug straight into our mobile phones and be recording and mapping those changing soundscapes of river systems. And that's sort of the underpinning idea for the River Listing Project, which is um, basically about mapping the cultural and biological diversity of river systems through sound. I'm going to power through a couple of these because I put my timer on and I realise I'm rapidly running out of time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, basically this idea of bringing these soundscapes of ecosystems back into urban environments where people can reconnect with these ecosystems and really looking at ways that we can push the boundaries of this technology. So a recent example for listening underwater at Horizon Festival last year, where the application itself actually updates with the tides. So as a participant, you know, you have to take your shoes off and connect with the water, walk along that coastline to actually access the soundscapes and the soundscapes changed and evolved every day and updated with those tides. And, the more recent iterations of these projects have been kind of taking away 
the mobile phones and bringing right back to kind of deep listening in the environment. So I found, you know, as a collective listening experience, when I was starting off these um, sound walks in the context of festivals and things, it would always be pretty messy at the start when people are downloading the app and um, always still having the screen in front of them. So I've shifted back for some of these collective listening festival sound walks to essentially use Bluetooth headphones and then walk along and around the ecosystem with an audience where I essentially mix the soundscapes in real time. And this is an example of a recent one where um, Gubby Gubby Songman, Brent Miller playing didgeridoo into the water, which was being picked up by the hydrophones and mixed into these soundscapes uh, in real time. And I was just going to close by saying the, um, the most recent iteration of this has been sort of exploring how we can facilitate a sound walk, an immersive sound walk connecting us to an environment completely remotely. So for Horizon Festival this year, just a few weeks ago, I collaborated with Lyndon Davis, local, local Gubby Gubby songman and Trisha King, who's a documentary photographer to create um, these immersive sound walks that were streamed live from the environment and basically allow people to connect with these ecosystems um, from their own home, which was obviously a response to being in um, COVID lockdown. So we use binaural recordings. So you could, um, you know, you felt like Lyndon was sitting beside you telling you this story of the river system while you were listening to the sounds beneath the surface um, of the river system itself. And this connected out into the ocean as well. All right, I think I will stop there. Thank you. Very nice, Leah. I, I don't think I've seen so much of your work sort of compiled um, in one presentation. Usually it's like all these snippets I see around social media and <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, and now we'll hand over to Ruth Irwin, please. Thanks, Leah, that was so cool. It's really nice to hear your stuff and it's really beautiful to hear yours too, Jo. Uh, so I'm, I guess, somebody who's very much part of the diaspora. Um, I'm a Kiwi. I was born and raised in New Zealand, but in various parts of the country. And I think my home is really the Manukau Harbour and the mountains are the Waitakere's. I grew up in Titirangi. Um, and I've really taken my understanding of, of both Pākehā and Māori culture with me wherever I've gone all over the world. So I've actually been living in Scotland for the last, um, well, eight of the last 20 years, so quite a long time. Um, and I'm Celtic, being Irish. So it's been really interesting being in Scotland and learning about the ancient ways there and how much has been lost, but also how much there is still to know, partly through archaeology and things like that. Um, and one of the things that I was really interested in with Māori philosophy, um, and I think I've talked to Joe and Tracy and various other people about this before, is the notion of whakapapa. And with whakapapa, everything is related. So often it's understood as um, genealogy and, and thinking about your ancestors, but it's a lot more than that, really. It's about the strata, it's about the plateaus, it's about the species, it's sort of a taxonomy of, of um, species and how they're connected to to humanity. So it's really a sort of a science, if you like. And I was thinking about that in relation to Scotland, and particularly there's a, a beautiful burial site in a tiny little island called Oronsay, which was close to where I was living. Um, and Oronsay, there's lots of middens, very old, about 6,000 year old middens. And in the middle of one of these middens is this beautiful um, burial where the person's knuckle bones has been carefully put in between the knuckle bones of a seal. So the seal flipper and the human hand line up together in this very intimate way. And I, for me, that's a really um, beautiful illustration of just how connected humanity has always been with the land and with the other species, with that we are all together as an eco ecological system and that this is part of our spirituality and part of our lives. 
And so I guess in my more intellectual work, I've been thinking a lot about um, climate change and contemporary economics and the way that it's based on a particular version of um, philosophy, which is very much about rationality and the individual and the individual having making consumer choices and decisions, and these all being aggregated together to create um, economic um, ways of being in this very, very contemporary modern world that we live in. So I use uh, these two things in juxtaposition to one another to start thinking about how we can be in the world in a contemporary way, but in a very embedded ecological um, flow instead of a sort of, a, you know, instead of a, um, a distinguished hierarchy where humanity is somehow over and above the rest of um, the ecology. So I guess I started from Māori philosophy because that's what I grew up with and that's what I know best and I find it a very, very rich, beautiful source. Um, but just lately I've also been thinking about quantum physics uh, and I've been reading up quite a lot about quantum physics and the way in which um, the observer and the observed or the matter is is in combination and actually reacts with one another and becomes settled through a sort of a reciprocal um, gaze, if you like. And so I'm sort of combining these two very, very different aspects to start thinking about the way in which we are completely embedded and interreacting and interlocuted with one another and with um, human, human subjectivity and with the, you know, natural objects that surround us. So I guess that's most of my work. I'm sort of taking that and trying to apply it to economics at the moment. Um, thinking through new economic systems, um, thinking about thermodynamics um, and slow economics in the same way that we might think about slow cooking. Um, so those are my ideas that are percolating around and I'm writing a new book on slow economics. And that's all I have to say. Maybe I'll open it up for questions later. Yep, definitely will be Ruth. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, and great timing. Uh, we'll hand over to Michelle now and I will attempt to be timekeeper because she's been keeping me to task on uh, trying to time keep. So over to you now, Michelle. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share screen if that's okay. And I'm, um, I hope that I can do as well as everyone else in keeping to time. So probably a little bit of a change of pace in a way. Um, I'm not a practicing artist, but I am, uh, I started my professional life as a lawyer. But you'll forgive me in a moment when I explain what we've been doing with our law and our economics and our other work. So Firstly, I'd like to um, say hello to everyone from Brisbane and acknowledge that um, I live, work and play on the ancient tribal lands of the Turrbal peoples. Um, Brisbane generally is referred to as having uh, the Yagara and Turrbal peoples, but North Brisbane is definitely the Turrbal. And that beautiful photo there of the water lilies is from a nearby um, uh, Nudgee waterholes. And Nudgee is the, the lovely local Aboriginal word for black duck. So I walk my dogs there and I... Oh, a timer going crazy um, and that's um, what I always like to use to acknowledge country. For those who might be on this call from other places um, that is a little arrow pointing to Brisbane and that's where I live in North Brisbane a very beautiful part of the world. So I was invited to join this lovely group of, of amazing creatives to share with you a bit of the work we do um, in the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. So I'm going to move through my slides quickly so I don't bore you um, but this little organisation was created by myself and a, a group of a small group of environmental lawyers in 2012. We all met and fell in love with um, earth laws and wild law in 2009. Our mission as a not-for-profit uh, group is to increase the understanding and practical implementation of earth-centred everything. But our focus is on particularly on the structural um, mechanisms that sort of underpin um, modern globalised society. We are inspired by a theory called Earth Jurisprudence, which is a big, big flash way of saying Earth-centred everything. 
Um, it's inspired by the work of Thomas Berry and First Nations People's Knowledge. We are first and foremost um, focused on systems change, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And my own personal passion is um, how we can reform the way human beings live and work together and uh, interact with the living world so that we can in fact live within the regenerative ecological limits that nature has so kindly provided to us. Um, interesting that Ruth referred to this idea of the hierarchical notions where humans see themselves at the top. This is a diagram we often use to um, really quickly explain to people what we're interested in as an organization and as a movement. <clears throat> this idea of shifting particularly the Western notion of hierarchical systems where human beings are more important than everyone else, separate to um, and able to utilize and, and extract everything at once from the living world and shifting society towards the image on the right, which is recognizing with humility that we are merely one member of an interconnected earth community. Um, another way to say it is as we sit at the precipice of climate change and um, mass level extinctions, you could say that industrial society has failed to manage its relationships with the living world, something that First Nations peoples around the world managed to um, manage and look after for millennia. So what AILA or, and what Earth Laws are interested in is two things, critiquing the current problems in industrialized societies and also offering creative responses to them. So whether you're looking at um, corporatism or corp uh, consumer capitalism, the legal, political, institutional and educational systems that we have that all place human beings as more important than the living world, um, then what we're interested in are the ideas that lie beneath. How do we change the mindset, the culture, uh, the systems change that's needed to shift the very practical day-to-day -day activities that humans engage in? As I mentioned before, um, Ayla's um, mission in life is to try to help be part of that shift towards an earth-centered way of thinking and acting. We've got five core themes, changing culture, reconnecting governance and law um, and systems with what matters, civil society focused, so building community, creating alternatives, and that means viable, sensible, sustainable alternatives to the current systems of, of law and economics, um, and also finally obviously transforming law and structure. This is a somewhat explosive slide that shows all of our different programs that connect to these five core themes of work. And I won't go through them all, but I guess I wanted to mention, particularly in light of this conversation tonight, um, from day one, we were fascinated with the interaction of creativity, the human spirit and um, shifting systems and imagining a different future. So Ayla is very interested in building and strengthening our personal relationships with nature, but also the structural shifts we have to take with everything from the way we work, the way we build housing, the way we interact with food systems, et cetera, et cetera. And our sort of spearhead program is called Green Prints, which um, if you ever want to look it up, the website is greenprints.org.au. Um, and onto my sort of my second and third last slides, as I say, we've always had a fascination with this connectivity between being a whole fully rounded human being with a spirit, creative um, inspiration, and the much more dry, desiccated realm of the Western professional or you know, broken down disciplines. So our arts program has always been a wonderful way to connect um, people with nature and with beautiful notions and ideas around what we're getting up to um, inside AILA. And this year, I'm really excited to be collaborating with Leah Barclay and her group, the Australian Forum for Acoustic Ecology. And we're running um, a range of activities under the heading of Voices of Nature. Um, and that's because I just wanted to finish off by saying this lovely Australian civilization that we have is built upon 80,000 years or more of good care and love for country. Australia's First Nations peoples are the oldest continuous culture on earth. And in AILA, we have always had a um, First Nations Partnerships Program, but as of last year, um, we are all working together to auspice a new organisation called Future Dreaming. And it's by working together that we're exploring a, a very different vision for the future on this continent um, with legal pluralism, supporting each other's, um, we often refer to it as your way, my way and our way, ensuring that no one um, suffocates each other's culture anymore but we do ensure that we have a long, beautiful, sustainable life here. And um, 
that is just a, our 89 bioregions across Australia, which I love to show people. Because in the work that Ayla does, which invites people, particularly a lot of disconnected Westerners who, for whatever reason, it's not their fault. The systems have meant they've been born and raised in a city and they don't really know the soils beneath them or the rivers that flow past them very well. Green Prince is all about getting to know Mother Nature as she tells us about herself. And one way to do that is through our bioregions. And the bioregions have a deep reflection into um, many of the traditional boundaries that uh, our First Nations colleagues and friends have respected for millennia. So that's it from me. I hope I didn't go over time, um, but that is a blue banded bee. I think one of the most remarkable little species in Australia and they live in my garden. So I'm particularly fond of them. I always like to end with an animal because they're so awesome. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Michelle. Um, oh, I guess now we'll open up for a, a conversation around some of the themes. I, I'd just like to start by sharing a story which I guess inspired me to think about having these connected uh, um, themes and also the range of different um, presenters. And that was very much a personal experience that I had connecting to place. And it was um, what led me into walking arts. And basically I um, was in a place in my life where I was fried. Um, I wasn't happy in my work. I was um, uninspired, uh, really not well and I started to walk on the weekends and I used to walk in the Namadji National Park which is in southern ACT so it's very beautiful um, Noonawal country and I found after five or six weekends of these quite hard walks because most of them were up hills I started to feel very differently about everything and I started to notice things that I never really paid attention to um, in the early parts of the walk, I was just like, oh, I've got to get up this hill. It's so horrible. Um, and then I was stopping and I was going, oh, what's that? And what's this? And really feeling that um, by being apart and at one and breathing with the trees and the environment around me, this deep sense of peace, I guess, and contentment and well-being. And I think that really started me thinking creatively that that really meant something. And maybe that was a pathway for thinking about other ways of connection. Um, and I think that very much resonated when I heard um, Miriam Rose Ungabar talk about um, Dadiri and deep listening. And um, that, um, concept is very much about sitting within nature and the stillness of nature and giving that space and finding that well-being uh, within yourself by opening up to that. So, um, and I guess too, what the flip of that is, is how do we, in COVID, I've noticed a lot more people walking around the suburbs and there seems to be a yearning for reconnection. And I think that, um, on that note, I'd really like to open up uh, to whoever wants to go first um, to think about that. Maybe Ruth, you'd like to start or Joe. I'm really open about who'd like to sort of um, maybe talk about the idea of deep listening and that connectedness to place. Any takers? Yep, I'll start. Cool. I just, can you hear me? I'm unmuted, eh? Yep. I'll mute myself now. Thanks, Jo. Yeah, with my um, current project, current research project that I'm doing, researching the botanical dyes of our native trees, for me, it's the, the beginning of my process starts with listening. Um, so I'm not just going to the trees and taking a bit of plant material and, and just going and experimenting, experimenting with it. What I'm doing is actually tuning in to the plants. Um, and how do I do that? I just go to the plant and acknowledge, maybe do karakia or you know, incantation or prayer um, or just an acknowledgement is enough. But I also, and something that I've been doing for a long time with my creative practice is you know, through photography is my way of connecting with the plants and with the trees and with my um, subject, which is usually nature. 
and just listening. And before I even begin to gather plant material, I'm listening, tuning in and hearing what the plant has to say about what its medicine is, what its, um, what its gift is or what its dye potential is. So that has been my process for a long time in terms of photography as well. But for me, it's, it's my creative process is quite intuitive and that listening is part of that intuitive process in terms of finding out what the plant, um, what its what its potential is in terms of its creative potential and how I can use the use the dyes. And again, it, it goes back to that connection, that intrinsic connection that we have to Papa Tuanuku, to the earth, to nature. It's something for me that is that is already there. It's not something that I have to try and achieve to to get there. It's something that's very much a part of me that I have. Um, you know, when I step outside my door. Um, barefoot or just step outside my door and nature's there, that connection is, is already exists. It's already there. I don't have to try and create that connection. It's already exists within me. I know that that tree is a part of me and I'm a part of that tree. So, yeah. Joe, I think what I love about that project, it's like the sacredness of the everyday. It's like we have a choice to see every day as some, you know, through our everyday actions um, and our other familiar as something that is special. And, and I love that, you know, it was a response to COVID, the project, but at the same time, you're investigating something at a very deep level that, that could be um, explored, you know, all over different parts of Aotearoa, but it's in your backyard. Yeah. Yeah, and um, just following on from what Ruth was talking about in terms of slow creation, slow economics, part of this project and, you know, when COVID happened here in Aotearoa, you know, for that whole month that we were in lockdown, I had no creativity, no desire to create. And it wasn't until coming out of the end of it and Creative New Zealand um, put out support for artists. And so this botanical my research came basically came out of that because I had seen Papa Tuanuku, the environment, the earth, have a rest when we were having a rest. Mm -hmm. And it really made me think deeply about my creative practice and what I was doing and what I wanted to do into the future. So what I'm doing now is creating totally with nature. Everything that I'm doing now is creating with nature so that anything that I do create can at any time go back to the earth, go back to the And it's sustainable, the materials I use, I'm, you know, only taking what I need. I'm using materials that are plentiful, that I can grow easily. Everything that I'm using for the botanical dyes come from my garden that I've grown over the last 10 years. And, you know, as Ruth mentioned, I'm on the same pathway. I, I, I'm... I just want to simplify it and slow and create with my hands again, just like I did when I was a child, when I was growing up with the bush. So I've done that big, big full circle. I want to create with my hands again. I want to create slow, meaningful pieces that, because it feels good to do that and it feels good to be creating sustainably for the earth. And yeah, I just think it's a good thing. Fantastic, Joe. Oh, um, so just following on from what you've just been saying, Joe, the I think one of the beautiful things that happened during COVID that a lot of people have become aware of, and, and it's kind of making me think about Leah and your sound stuff too, is there's all these examples of when dolphins, for example, have come up the canals and up the rivers and, you know, whales are... Uh, are exploring places that they haven't explored for ages and it's because the whole you know during COVID when the whole industrial system started to slow down it enabled all these other species to kind of retake their space you know to to regrow into their territory and to actually speak louder and have a, a louder presence to be more present I mean and 
in um, the North Island in New Zealand, there's a, a river in the Waikato, uh, I think it's called the Piako River, and a pod of about 30 dolphins went up, you know, 30 miles up this river, like ages up this river. Just incredible. And people were sort of standing on the side of the river going, can you believe it? Like, that's incredible. We've never seen that happen before. So I, I think um, we can slow down, you know, we can actually live more quietly. We don't have to have this incredible growth drive and need to be constantly expanding and expanding and expanding. Humans actually can coexist much more happily than they have been in the last 200 years. And I think what we're exploring here are the ways in which we can tread lightly on the, on the planet and do a lot more listening. I think this notion of listening is incredibly, incredibly important. And to understand that other species, and not just, um, not just animal species, but plants, rocks, you know, all the other flora, fauna, mushrooms, um, but also the geology actually of the land has its own kind of form of communication, its own form of languaging. And if we are in tune with it, we can actually, as Joe was just saying, we can really listen and hear. It's, we are capable of hearing a lot. Um, but we have to, and I think one of the things that's happened, not just with COVID, but perhaps even longer, but I think COVID really brought it out, is this notion of mindfulness, well, which um, probably isn't my forte in a way, but I think it does lend itself to this way of listening or a more aware listening. Um, so I actually feel more optimistic in the last 12 months, two years than I have done for most of my life. Because <laughs> I think things are changing. It's really good. Yeah, I agree with you, Ruth. I, I dare to hope because I have seen with COVID, you know, the birds come back and you know, big fluffy clouds in the sky, things like that, that I hadn't seen for a, quite a long time. Um, and I just put in the chat, I loved your story about the dolphins because I heard on the news today that a whale was found in the East Alligator River, which is in the top of Australia in Arnhem Land for people who aren't familiar uh, with, with Australia's mainland, uh, which is crocodile country. And so they had to shepherd this poor whale out of the um, out of the crocodile infested waters, so he could happily go on his way down to Antarctica. So um, that has no bearing on the conversation. It's just a tidbit <laughs> that I thought was interesting, like a whale in the East Alligator. Wow. Yeah, um, Leah, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts because you've worked with lots of different communities. Um, and deep listening is very much uh, the tenor of what you do in, in your practice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess, you know, all of the acoustic ecology work I've been engaged with has been, you know, very much about deep listening and looking at, you know, the way we can use deep listening as an education tool as well. I mean, just thinking about what Ruth was saying around, you know, treading lighter and moving slower. I mean, you know, using those sort of deep listening techniques uh, with young students as well. I mean, you can kind of see that change in real time, you know, running these sound workshops with kids where they all jump off the bus frantically running around, stomping on the plants and pulling leaves off trees and then just engaged in sort of, you know, a 45 minute process of like listening through their feet and sound walking and, you know, learning those kind of deep listening practices and suddenly completely aware of, um, you know, all of the environment around them and treading lighter and talking about how the sounds of their footsteps might feel to ants as they're walking along the ground and things like that. So I guess a big part of the work, you know, that I've been engaged with with those community-based projects has been, you know, about education as well. I mean, I think you know, the idea of a sound walk or the idea of deep listening when, you know, you talk about it in the context of a university course or something like that and students are always a bit sceptical, like, oh, yeah, well, what's a sound walk? You know, we're just walking and listening. And I think it's not until people actually engage in that process because we're so visually dominant and we let, you know, in that everyday 
sort of scenario, like our, our ears and our auditory perception is always giving us so much more information about our surrounding environment than anything else. Yet we are so visually dominant, we don't often, you know, stop to have those embodied listening experiences. So I think, you know, just the idea of being able to facilitate those, um, you know, those opportunities in the context of communities. And I mean, I truly believe sort of the more, you know, people we can have engaged, you know, the more young people that can engage in these listening processes and engage with the idea of, of sound as a way to understand the health of the environment. Um, yeah, I mean, there is loads of hope for the future. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, hearing Joe's wonderful stories before and making me want to collaborate with Joe again, every time I hear Joe speak, I want to collaborate with Joe. <laughs> but, you know, thinking back to that, you know, the first collaboration we did along the, um, um, the Tehanui walkway with, um, you know, a, a really beautiful deep listening experience where we, you know, blindfolded the audience. And I think what was really exciting about that project is, you know, we were, we were listening to the natural soundscape that was there in the environment. And we were, we planted Bluetooth speakers throughout this sound walk and Joe was singing on the sound walk as well. And so for the audience who are blindfolded, they were listening to the natural environment as if it was, you know, part of this pre-recorded soundscape. And, you know, there were long moments in that experience where there was, you know, no pre-recorded material. It was purely immersed in this sort of beautiful, rich soundscape that was along that walkway, yet, you know, the audience didn't really know what was happening in real time and what was pre-recorded. So it was, I think, you know, moments like that where we can encourage people to listen you know more deeply to their surrounding environment as well I'm going off on tangents now but no you're not it's all good um, <laughs> you remind me recently we did a bird walk uh, at gin and dairy uh, conservation park which is over the back of where we live and i've noticed all these different birds in the garden but i couldn't work out which bird was making which sound and now I know, I know which one is the crimson rosella, which one is the fairy wren. And it just gives you a whole different appreciation, I think. And, um, you know, and I'm speaking from someone who was trained as a visual artist. So, you know, sort of the importance of sound has sort of come mainly through video, but definitely through experiencing place. Um, so, yeah, really, really wonderful. And. I'd like to maybe turn to Michelle now and talk about maybe how this could figure in terms of an Earth Judas. Uh, um, I'm not very good with just call it Earth laws. I Earth laws. I can do word. that. <laughs> I get a bit tongue tied. Well, I mean, I think the short answer is the entire uh, critique of the separation that Western life and particularly globalized industrialized life last couple of hundred years, the critique of, of these societies from an earth jurisprudence point of view does focus on the separation that humanity has created between itself and, and the living world. So listening deeply, slowing down and taking time, finding a sit spot, getting to know the local plants and animals. And I mean, the ones in your yard, as well as the ones in beautiful places where you go bushwalking, um, all of those elements of connecting, respecting, learning about and caring for um, the living world are deeply embedded in the work that we do and certainly um, offer deep challenges to the way that legal systems work today. And the quickest example that a non-lawyer can relate to is that in Australia, under the legal system, we um, um, non-Indigenous people brought to the continent, one of the most profound foundation stones of that legal system was the notion that nature is merely property. The basis of uh, the entire capitalist economic system and, and feudalist capitalist uh, emergence was private property and people believing they owned land and believing that they had rights amongst each other about this land rather than a different belief which says we have emerged from the, literally from the soils of the, of the planet and we are merely part of this place and to have less of an idea of ownership and more of an idea of love, care, respect, family, kinship, custodianship. So I think earth jurisprudence or earth laws um, is an absolute call for disconnected uh, folks in particularly modern societies 
to reconnect in whatever way you can. So. Yeah, really nice. And um, and I think too, you know, when I when I thought about the sacred, it was very much in the context of transdisciplinarity because. It, for me, it, it seemed to be one of the few Western theories. I mean, I'm not a theorist, so Ruth will probably claim me for this, but it was one of the few ways of framing things that actually included all aspects of self. And I mean, I think, um, you know, I was very much uh, studied art history. I was interested in spirituality and I was very much encouraged, no, we don't go there. Um, especially when we're talking about nature and art, you know, it was very much the, stereotype of the hairy hippie um, and it was quite a, a limited um, avenue for me to explore in art history but I think it's that was 20 years ago but now I still find that a very powerful even more so because we're talking about being connected and like you're saying um, Michelle and what everybody's reflected on is is looking at things not from that view of ownership at that um, the land owns us and that we're part of the land we're not separate from it so I guess the sacred in in the context of the panel I very much saw that is about connection and um, yeah I'd really like um, maybe at this point do we feel everyone want to continue having conversation or did we want to start maybe looking at some of the questions from the audience well, I'd just like to add one thing. Yes, just please. Thinking about um, law, Michelle. Um, I, I, in New Zealand, in Aotearoa, there's been a couple of really fantastic examples, uh, one with the Uruwera Mountains and the other with the Whanganui River, um, both of which have been like different tribes have taken that through a very arduous and long legal process yeah. To get those, um, the Uruweras and that river, the Whanganui, to be recognised as legal persons. Yep. And uh, well, that's, it's very, very well known in earth laws and rights of nature circles. Um, yeah. It's a slightly different legal approach using the construct of a legal personhood approach, which is what we've given corporations. It's actually problematic and a little flawed, but the fact that a Western legal system has listened to the Maori people and taken on board their ideas of the spiritual life of these systems and trying to shift the Western legal system is profound. Uh, it's been hugely inspiring. I mean, it's triggered the laws in India, Bangladesh, Colombia, um, discussions in many other parts of the world around the rights of particular ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Where Tom Perry was talking about wasn't legal personhood, it was respecting the rights of different plants, animal systems to be what they are, not persons or people. But that's a whole nother discussion. But yeah, it's been a remarkable development that's influenced, you know, the whole planet. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It's very cool. Just to jump in on that, um, I was with some a whole bunch of different representatives from across the Murray Darling Basin, which is for overseas listeners, is a very large river system, which is a third of the landmass of Australia. And uh, we talked about that uh, Wanganui um law and we were going wouldn't that be phenomenal if australia could have something like that because water laws in australia are extremely problematic um and uh it's very much as as um, michelle was talking about it's very much about property um you know and and they have a thing called e-water it's not electronic water it's environmental water so, um, but I won't get into that, but I think, yes, it's very inspiring the work that's been happening in New Zealand and setting the pace for what other countries could be doing. And can I just quickly respond? In Australia, um, we have the first local council in the world who's made a resolution to explore what rights of nature could look like in its literal day-to-day -day operations. Mm. And Ayla is working with them. It's the Blue Mountains Council. And we have a number of different communities looking at rights of nature related laws for their local areas and, and beyond. So it's really interesting. And can I just say that one of the coolest things I was invited into this year was a discussion about should the moon have its own legal rights? Because very hungry space exploration people are looking towards it. 
So a couple of us are actually drafting what I think could be the world's first declaration on the rights of the moon, which feels both surreal and a huge privilege. So that's literally what I'm doing when I get up in the morning to work with these folks on this. We don't know where it'll go, but we're gonna share it on our websites and build a movement of, of the community of earthlings looking up at our most beautiful, silvery, shiny companion since the dawn of time and trying to say, please don't dig lots of holes in it and make it nasty. That sounds fantastic, Michelle. It really is exciting and amazing. So there's a question from Till that says, what is the relationship between listening with our bare ears to the soundscapes we are in and the technology to listen? That sounds like a Leah question. Sure, I can have a go at answering that one. I mean, I guess there's, we can think about that in, you know, in a lot of different ways in that a lot of the field recording technology, you know, is really just facilitating an extension of our ears or an amplification of our ears. I mean, I work a lot, obviously, with, you know, different ecosystems like underwater environments or, um, you know, ecosystems that are traditionally and sounds traditionally beyond our perception, like infrasonic and ultrasonic ranges. So, you know, we do need specialised microphones to be able to hear those sounds in the environment. So, I mean, the relationship between them, obviously, it shifts on the intention of um, why you're recording and what you're recording for. But I think it can be a really powerful experience in the field, like, you know, hearing Joe tell those beautiful stories about connecting with plants and this idea now that, you know, so much, I guess, of the narrative around plant sounds historically has been this idea of plant sonification, you know, this idea that we're sort of sonifying the, the electromagnetic frequencies of a plant when plants make sound, you know, there's scientific evidence that plants are, are using sound to communicate and survive and make decisions and um, a lot of that work's being pioneered by people like Monica Gagliano in Australia and I think it's um, you know this idea of sort of using technology to, to facilitate those heightened connections and, and amplification of our, um, our senses that you know all of those sounds are there in the environment anyway you can kind of sense them through your body and through your feet it's just that our you know auditory perception sometimes needs that extension of technology you know to be able to capture and record them or well, that's one way you could think about it anyway i mean i've run these plant recording workshops um with indigenous elders you know on the sunshine coast as well and you know we've had some really powerful recordings uh, working with Vicky Saunders who's been part of the listening to country project I've been um, working on for a couple of years you know I was kind of explaining to her that we we can use the technology to sort of attempt to hear the sounds of the plant but the sounds of you know inside a tree will always be really unpredictable like we might need to take the recordings back to the studio and, and transpose them out of an ultrasonic range so um, you know, so we can hear them. Like we might put on the headphones and attach the microphones to the tree and, and hear nothing more than what we would hear through just listening. But I mean, we had a beautiful experience where, you know, we had hydrophones, so underwater microphones wrapped around the trunk of a tree and, and Vicky put the headphones on and was listening and she, um, you know, could hear this kind of clicking and popping inside the tree, which was like, you know, she described it as the heartbeat of a tree. And what was really quite profound is you know when she put her hands on the tree and was interacting with the tree this sound you know this kind of internal rhythm of the tree just kind of slowed down so it was it completely the sound of the tree completely responded to um the way she was interacting with the tree so i think you know we can think of technology field recording technology in that sense as as a way to yeah help us give a heightened connection to parts of ecosystems that we don't traditionally have access to. It was a very long answer to a simple question. So oh, I think, yeah, I, I was thinking of an artist, her name's Christina Della Gustina, and she's done a lot of tree research and she presented this paper and she put this question forward. She said, um, how, how would I communicate to a tree? It's the same question as how do I communicate with you? 
anyway, that's just me being philosophical. <laughs> um, I've got a question. Anyone else want to respond to that from the panel? Yeah, I just have a little bit of a cordial. So in terms of listening with our ears and our senses, we have a word, a word for listen, to listen is whakarongo. Um, rongo is the word that we use for, I mean, those who know te reo Māori know that one word means many things. And rongo is our word for all the senses. So eyes, ears, smell, um, touch, feel. And... It's interesting. It's an interesting question because thinking about my project, my current project um, with the botanical dyes, I'm really when I'm extracting the colours from the plant material, I'm really tuning into the smell of the plants as well. It wasn't something that I intended to do, but it's just something that's come up. It's part of the research, and you know, thinking about technology and, and having worked with Leah before. Um, I know that she's always really respectful and is is kind of tuned into the work that she's doing. And I feel like that our connection, intrinsic connection that we have to to nature and technology, there's a place, which is what I think Leah was trying to say, is that there's a space or place that where those two meet, where what we feel intrinsically, our connection, you know, spiritual connection to nature, technology can do that for us if we haven't kind of quite got that um, connection within ourselves. So I reckon there's a, a space where those two things meet. Um, I believe that our chipuna, our ancestors, were very connected and connected in ways that we haven't even got to yet, with even with technology today. So... Um, yeah, that's my little contribution there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jo. Uh, yeah, really nice connection to the, um, the, the space where these things meet, the, that meeting place. I love that as, a, as an idea. Does anybody have any other responses before we hand over to the next question? I take that as a no. So this one's from Billy. Who, um, who I met at the Locative Media um, Summer School. We were in the same team and did a wonderful project called Arboretum, by the way, about trees. Um, she wrote, do you think, with apologies to members of the audience, that this is a gendered approach to listening? Who's going to take that one? Well, I actually think the comment from the lovely person in the audience of the audience, the participant was a, was a good answer. I had popped in and answered it because I thought we were wrapping up at 7.30 and that person wouldn't get their question asked. Um, anyway, I can't find it, but I said, look, there's actually just as many men involved in sound recordings as women. Certainly I've worked with folks through Leah's networks, um, but then somebody else, I think it might've been Till said, um, there's also many people who are, um, uh, non-gendered or um, whatever words they choose to use to describe their own life energy who love sound recordings so um, the extent to which gender is or is not part of an approach to connecting to nature perhaps could end up being very subjective so but that's just my little reflection of our lovely colleagues response which is terrific I, I can, oh, sorry, Ruth, you go, you go, Ruth. No, I'll, I'll go, go after you, Jo. You, you go and then I'll go after you. I was just going to say, we have a, going back to Te Reo Māori again, we have a word for both male and female. There's no distinguishing between the two and it's called ia. We use ia for he, she, him, her, all the same. Um, but ia is also a word that we use for flow. So that's just another thing to add to that conversation in terms of, um, the gender conversation. That is so cool. I really love that. <laughs> okay. Um, what I wanted to say is, in a way, I think it's a gendered conversation in terms of the politics of gender, not in terms of the physiology of gender. So by that, what I mean is, there's a history of a very gendered history of um, pro privileging and, and hierarchizing 
a very uh, masculine idea of what the individual rational individual is, um, which actually bears no relation whatsoever to a man, right? But it's a it's a a concept of or a sort of a an illusion of what a man ought to be, or what a a particular kind of idealized man ought to be, and I think. Um, Feminism, in the, particularly probably in the 80s, um, really did a lot of very, very good work to talk about embodiment and emotions and how a lot of our knowledge and a lot of our ways of understanding are actually embodied ways of understanding. And, you know, there's people like Lucy Rigori who talked extensively about the fluidity of women's bodies and how... Um, women exceed and overflow this notion of the individual rational utility maximizer. But, you, you know, men also exceed and overflow the individual rational utility maximizer. So I think although the discourse has come out of feminism, particularly a, a particular kind of 80s feminism, um, I'd say that most feminists now would be very inclusive about all kinds of bodies, which none of which are exclusively reductive to rationality and none of which are exclusively individuated and none of which, um, all, all of which exceed and, and have spit and we and poo and all of these things which don't fit very nicely into the rational way of liberal understanding. There's one here from um, Bethan, Asking, have any of us worked with uh, deaf community with sound projects? No, don't think so. I have a little bit, but only mm. through sort of individual workshops and things like that using um, transducers, so vibrational speakers and We've been developing VR projects around um, using spinal transducers. So essentially devices that let sound play through your body as opposed, so you're hearing and feeling vibrations as opposed to, um, mm. you know, physically hearing with your auditory perception, which is, I think, you know, something that we haven't really explored a whole lot in terms of its potential, that idea of, um, kind of whole body listing with those sort of transducer speakers as well. There's a lot of potential to be explored further there. I'm interested too in, I don't know where I read it, but um, I mean, and, and reflecting on your work, Leah, and, and I guess very old work of Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, how, um, you know, how sound is also, you know, potentially used for earth law, you know, to actually um, argue for the preservation, you know, of forests and um, and land and, and water. Um, have you been approached, Leah, you know, maybe to share your work in that context? Yeah, well, through Biosphere Soundscapes, we've been involved in, in quite a bit of that. And I mean, that little device I showed earlier, the audio moth, you know, just a few months ago, well, probably about six months ago now, you, our recording from that was used in court in, um, in South America to give evidence that illegal logging was happening in an area that they were claiming it wasn't. So, I mean, there's plenty of evidence now of um, sound recordings, that idea of communities having tangible evidence from these locations um, being used for law now and I mean you know in terms of UNESCO and the World Network of Biosphere Reserves the work that they're doing around kind of redesigning and reframing how biosphere reserves are kind of monitored managed and how their designation is reviewed they're building soundscapes into that process now as a result you know of, of some of the long-term work we've been doing, you know, advocating for it through Biosphere Soundscapes, but I mean to actually see that they're looking at soundscapes as a measure for environmental health in Biosphere Reserves now is, is really exciting. And I mean, likewise, when we look underwater, I mean, seismic testing is, um, you know, still happening uh, and increasing in multiple places across the planet, including up the coastline of Australia, which is absolutely 
horrifying the impact that it has in the ocean but you know we would never get away with what is happening in the oceans in a terrestrial environment because if humans were exposed to that kind of um you know horrific noise i mean it's trauma it's like it would be like having a nail gun go off 30 centimeters from your eardrum every three seconds it's um yeah so i mean the i'm not sure where i was going with that one but i went on a rant about noise pollution underwater but yeah i mean there's there's increasing research and i mean michelle obviously can talk to this as well but increasing research and engagement around you know sound as a tool for activism policy and, and change as well yeah and thinking of sound underwater i remember when i was in norway and i know that you've done quite a bit of work in norway as well leah that um that i remember an artist telling me that they were um doing explosives in the harbour in the um, fjord of Oslo so the cruise ships could um, come in and I was just absolutely blown away because there's all coral reef country there and I, I thought you know that would never happen in Australia but we do some other things in this country that are probably more scary and more to, um, negative to the land but there's this sense of when you do things underwater it's invisible as well so it doesn't really happen so it's not yeah. a land <laughs> no well and that idea that you know we sort of i guess are fed this narrative of acoustic environments being uh, aquatic environments so being you know very sort of peaceful and relaxing and quiet calm environments but i mean they're acoustic environments they're they're, they're places where you know all species are using sound to communicate and survive i mean the Great Barrier Reef is is an acoustic environment. It, it functions around sound. So the impact that, you know, anthropogenic noise is having and, you know, those examples you were chatting about earlier around that, I guess, the, the pause and the quiet we've seen in the oceans and how marine life have reacted to that. You know, we're now seeing evidence in multiple places across the planet, Portugal, Australia, of whales actually now attacking vessels because they've had that moment of six months of reduced anthropogenic noise. There's been studies around, you know, seeing um, stress hormones actually reduce in whales. So they're getting back to this sort of functional state of, of quiet oceans. And now with anthropogenic noise picking up again, they're actually attacking some of these vessels. There was just an article last week in, in Portugal around some of that. Yeah, very interesting stuff there's another um interesting thing about whales and sound which i've tuned into when i was living in fiji because apparently there's a lot of um uh ocean ecologists who quite often just put down speakers into the water so there's there's hundreds of these things all over the world and they've been sharing um sound files with one another particularly about the really big whales that send enormous so they send calls across, like blue whales can send a, a call across half the planet. It's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And so there's been this um, real like surge over the last, say, 20 years where people are, uh, are recording massive numbers of recordings of these whales and they're actually starting to decipher some of what they're on about. Um, and there's also there's one whale called the lonely whale. I don't know if I've ever talked to you about this, which is nobody's ever seen it it's one whale it's as big as a blue whale because it's the only single whale that can send a call halfway around the planet and it nobody responds to it it's the last of its kind it's the last of its species so i mean That's i, I just think the acoustic thing in ecology is just in the way of listening you know that joe was talking about before um the other thing I really, really struck me when I was living in Fiji is that the reef, the reef in the morning first, it's like, um, it's like birds, you know, when the birds have their dawn chorus. <clears throat> if you actually go out into the water and just put your ear down, first thing in the morning, the, the reef is really alive with all these clickety clack clack, you know, the, the fish are just making all this a dawn chorus. And they also do it at the last thing before the sun as the sun goes down, they make this amazing, 
It's incredible. Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for that one. Um, there was another question I saw here. Ruth, what was that phrase you used about the rational body in comparison to embodied understanding? Um, the, you mean the rational utility maximizer? Maybe. This is a question from Nina. Uh, well, oh, yeah, that was for me. That was the phrase. I just didn't catch it. How, what was what? The, what was the three words and when you put them so, together? So it's about it's a it comes out of neoliberalism. It comes from um, uh, Popper and people like that. And basically, their their notion is that you have the individual who's rational. So it's the individual rational utility maximizer. And utility maximizer means greed, basically. It means it means that to make a rational decision is to be greedy and to maximize the usefulness of the resources that you are that you have access to. And those resources could be yourself, or it could be other people or it could be the natural environment so you're you're maximizing the use value of whatever it is that's around you and making money out of it rational utility maximizer individual rational utility maximizer i find that fascinating you know with my pa past life hat on in um in public service you know and and the focus of policy design is always to imagine the human as a rational decision-making machine, which yeah. um, of course we all know is just ridiculous, um, you know, and, and doesn't take into account anything to do with, you know, the, the cultural, financial, um, spiritual, any sort of circumstances that that human might be dealing with. Um, so I think that's a great term. I'm going to use it, Ruth. I don't know where, but I'm going to. Yeah, and the sad thing is it's been critiqued for a really long time and, you know, by a, a huge range of people. And yet, as you say, Tracy, it is fundamental to policy making and fundamental to a certain kind of classical and neoliberal economics. There's actually a whole lot of other ways of, of doing policy and there's a whole lot of other ways of doing economics, heterodox economics, um, which don't use it. And none of it gets taken seriously for some bizarre reason. And I think it's time that we, I don't know, took ownership and said, we're not putting up with that stuff anymore. Because, I mean, it, it got thrown out in the sort of 70s. That's how long it's been critiqued. It's yeah. very frustrating. The, the wheels turn slowly mm. when it comes to to the government decisions and policy design and, and I guess resistance, you know, to change. Um, yeah, but very interesting point. My question is asking, this is from Emma, asking for advice and slowing down in fast paced societies and cultures, challenges of that, what it takes to really embody life at nature's pace. Thank you, very inspired sharings. Hmm. I mean, from for myself personally, I'm in, in nature a lot, so that's how I find my connection and my slowing down. Um, I meditate at night time before I go to sleep. Um, it's something that I did for a long time earlier on when I, in my early twenties for six years. I was meditating day and night for an hour, morning and night, and so it's kind of set me up for. Um, good practice. I mean, there's a long period of time where I didn't practice for that long. Um, but I find even just five minutes or 10 minutes of being still um, doesn't have to be out of nature, but it can be out of nature. And also just connecting with nature, just going outside and being there can help you um, slow down as well. It's, it's, something that's very much a part of my life now it's part of my creativity and um i mean i'm not always you know i'm often working with many things on my plate and 
as I've gotten older, I've realized that I need more tools, <laughs> more tools to kind of keep me um, sane and keep me, um, keep life um, simple. And, and, and that's it is actually me simplifying my life as well, which is, you know, in terms of the creative practice that I have right now is all part of that slowing down and um, not taking on too much, saying no. It's a hard thing to do, isn't it? I'm mm -hmm. totally relating to that. Um, does anyone else want to respond to that question? Um, yeah, I will. Leah, unless you want to jump in. No. Yeah. Uh, there's another question here from Jeremy where he says, um, how does the panel feel about the paradox between the digital, fast speeds, instantaneous, and listening, deliberative, immersive? I think it's really interesting that this is coming up for so many people in the chat box. Um, and in a way, I think it's really, it doesn't surprise me because it is kind of key to what we're talking about here where we've got people like Leah who's doing all this incredible deep listening stuff using technology, Joe, who's like the, her attunement is just, you know, really profound and really visible. And, and yet we live in this really um, fast community where, you know, I mean, there are some cities in the world where people are living in 60, 90 story high um, buildings, one next to one another for miles. And it's very hard for them to find, you know, nature and to be out in nature so not all of us are as privileged as we are in New Zealand or even Australia where there's space and uh, <clears throat> so I have really mixed feelings about technology I think Heidegger um, made a really profound analysis of modern technology where he says that the essence of technology is nothing technological it's all about and he's talking about modern technology. He's, he's saying the essence of modern technology is to understand everything as a resource that can be potentially consumed, which is what I was talking about before with the rational individual utility maximizer, you know, where you understand absolutely everything as potentially consumable. And that's what modernity is all about. It's about consumption, the consumer society. And I think what, what this panel is all about is is reframing the technological so that we can understand the technological as part of a, of a a deeper listening or a deeper way of inhabiting the planet that we exist with. And I didn't say exist on. <laughs> so, you know, I think that that these questions are actually honing in on a really important shift that's taking place where it's not about throwing out technology, it's not about saying technology is bad or that it's necessarily this consumer model, but it's to say when technology has been the consumer model, what it does is it enframes the way in which we think and it's very, very difficult for people to think outside that framework and so everybody tends to only be in this very narrow approach to, to everything being consumable. But you can do it in the way that Joe and Leah have, and Tracy are advocating, which is this incredibly deep, slow, really inhabited, embedded, embodied listening style. And technology can actually help that, you know. We now know about the whales all across the planet. You know, we know about um, Leah's putting microphones in the middle of the bush um, or down by the ocean. You know, we, we can hear the fish. We can hear the fish with our own ears because our own ears are a kind of a technology as well, yeah. Our own breathing is a type, kind of technology. Our own meditative practices is a kind of technology. So we don't have to um, think of technology as something outside and other either. It's part of who we are um, and indeed there's loads of species that use technology nests birds when they make a nest when they're using sticks are using technology to make a nest so there's no way you know we don't have to see humans as somehow an apex predator or an apex technology user instead we can say 
technology is actually part of what it is to be part of the planet. But it's a different in framing. Oh, I love that, Rue. I, I really love too, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, sort of creatures and their own technologies. And for me, I, I'm seeing termite mounds and other different amazing things that um, non-human creatures do and, and how trees have their own technologies under the ground, like they link and connect to each other as a community. So it's such a rich, um, yeah. Um, you know, I'm super guilty of consistently doing way too many things at once and always overloading myself with too many projects. So I'm probably not the best person to give advice on, you know, slowing down with projects. But I think, um, you know, all of the work that obviously I'm engaged with is, is fundamentally about listening. And for me, it, that's the best part of those projects is to be, you know, in the field listening and recording. And I think if I, if I wasn't engaged in that practice and just doing the manic amount of projects I'm sort of involved with, then I probably, you know, wouldn't survive without that practice of deep listening. But I think, you know, echoing what, you know, Ruth was saying around that, that I guess, the, you know, a lot of the tensions that we're seeing around technologies and, you know, just seeing how some of my students consume content, you know, watch lectures and listen to lectures at double speed at the same time as doing five other things at once. And, um, you know, the, I guess the attention span we're seeing on, on how people are suggesting content should be consumed in things like locative media apps. I mean, there was a lot of talk around this idea if, you know, a sound doesn't load within three seconds, then you've lost your audience because people are just going to kind of click away and um, not engage with it. So there's, there's, I guess, this compromise that we're making with those sound walking apps around, you know, having to have really short and small sound files so they load quickly so that people are staying engaged. But, you know, I guess there's been so much talk as well of this idea around ways particularly to get young people to re-engage with the environment is to disconnect you know take away mobile technologies and things like that but i guess a lot of the locative media work that i've been engaged with in these sound mocking applications has been all about you know how technology can be a tool to reconnect with the environment and as a way like that the idea of you know sounds that update with the tides like it's it's about drawing people into these ecosystems to reconnect with the environment and using technology as a way to facilitate that and you know as an extension of um what from the perspective of field recording as an extension of how we can engage with the environment so yeah i guess that's how i would answer that one mm. and i guess following on from that leah andrew asked a question about your work um about blindfolding the audience so is the listening experience different in a group rather than as an individual yeah i think i might have quickly answered that one in the chat i think for the the one that we were talking about that was the collaboration with joe for intercreate which i can't remember if you were there or not tracy i think you were no i know ruth was there yeah the um i think it, it was very much about I was a there, group sorry. collective yeah i think you were there a group collective listening experience because we had um you know the audience was sort of all connected we had people actually with their hands on each other's shoulders to walk along the pathway so i think it would have been quite well it would have been quite a different experience um had it have just been solo listening and i i find that very much with you know comparing these um you know, the sound walks that are being live mixed with, you know, the Bluetooth headphones versus the mobile apps. When you're doing a collective experience with the mobile applications, I find that people are immediately kind of disconnected because they're engaging with their phones and they're going off in all different directions and they're looking at the screen and they're not connecting with the environment. And we ran, you know, a, a, just a test last year to compare exactly the same sound material but running it through the app 
and then another version where it was no app i was mixing it all live and they purely had the headphones on and everyone sort of reported that they were hearing completely different soundscapes it was a much more profound listening experience because they were engaging you know with the environment around them and listening without having to you know trigger sounds or interact with their phone screen and of course you know there's ways that we can do it both ways but it's it's interesting just to think that you sort of take away the pressure of um, having to interact with the phone screen and just let people be immersed in the environment with these headphones that are being live mixed and exactly the same sounds but a completely different listening experience that um, that people had, which was quite fascinating. Yeah. Mm, very interesting. I love the thought too, you know, because we all perceive things differently as well. Our own perception makes us experience the world profoundly differently to begin with. Mm. I was just going to add to that last conversation about um, the paradox between the digital and uh, digital and listening. I mean, I've realised, you know, as I've moved, you know, moved on in my um, creative career, but also as I've gotten older, talking about getting older again. Um, that I feel like I, I don't want to be online as much as I used to and going back to the slow creation thing, just wanting to create um, and be offline more. But it's interesting because as an artist who is dependent on the online environment um, for my art, I mean, I've been a full-time artist for 15 years and a lot of the work that I sell is online. It's it's kind of interesting navigating this pathway at the moment and looking at other ways that I can do that as well as share my art. Again, it's a platform that um, I share a lot of my work to connect with my audience. So it's, it's interesting. And just thinking back to um, the project that Leah was talking about, the soundscape that she did in Taranaki for the art residency, that was nine years ago. And, you know, the technology then has changed since then um we didn't have the technology back then that we do now which is kind of interesting to think about that and how you know how quickly technology um changes and yeah i thought i'd just add add to that i remember uh, I totally how thrilled we were at the idea of bluetooth speakers that we were planting <laughs> these little bluetooth <laughs> Increase and yes. we thought it was revolutionary. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was back then. <laughs> Little hamburger ones, were they? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I've actually been finding, you know, since COVID, and we've been using Zoom and, and this sort of video based technologies a lot, that I've gone back to the phone, actually having long conversations with friends on the phone or family on the phone, which is something I haven't done probably for 10 years. You know, like we don't have a home phone and haven't had a home phone for ages, but it's interesting how different situations um, lead to different kinds of responses. So we've got the technology to do all this video conferencing and yet, you know, I'm sort of talking to friends saying, oh, let's not do Zoom, like let's just chat on the phone. You know, so mm. I think we've got all the options now, um, except getting too close physically. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's interesting in itself. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw another question from Elspeth. Um, thank you for this rich discussion. I was just thinking of the difference between hearing and listening and how it links to political activism. That's a great question. Do you know, I had a thought about that. Um, cool. about Elspeth's question, but also in relation to technology and the stuff that we've just been thinking about now. And I've, I've been thinking about algorithms and the whole bubble effect. It, I don't know if you, um, if you guys have all tuned into it, but there's been a sort of a, a furore in the UK because all the kids were about to take their A-levels, which is like their, you know, UE. I don't know, what do you call that in Australia? What's UE in Australia? University entrance, you know, like the last exam. Uh, matriculation or HSC. Yeah. So 
obviously um, they've all been shut down and COVIDed out for about five months. So the kids haven't been going to school or sort of erratically going to school. So they tried to use a, an algorithm to guess which students would pass their matriculation and which students would not pass their matriculation. And what they discovered is that the algorithm made a whole lot of assumptions based on class, ethnicity and gender, which basically meant that all the private school kids got through their matriculation, even if they probably didn't really deserve to, and all the public school kids, and particularly the working class ones, failed. And the results were so, so appalling and so clearly, you know, outrageous that the whole country had a big uproar about it and it got completely chucked out. But what it made, but to me, what it made really visible is the same effect that's going on with Facebook and that's going on with um, Google. And that is that we're all talking in our own little bubbles and we're not actually getting much exposure and we're not listening to people that are different from us. You know, like even if you think about this talk that we've got going on here, um, in some ways we're all quite diverse, but in another way, most of us have known each other for quite some time and we are talking about quite about things that have been quite marginalized so it's been quite important for us to have this community with each other but we're talking amongst the already converted you know and we're not really talking outside of that and we're not kind of getting wider exposure and I think that's what's happening a lot is that we through through um, online communities it's partly about being online and the technology of online but I think the other thing that is really significant about it is just the sheer numbers of population there is across the globe now you know like when I was born there was three billion people which was already a huge number and now there's 7.8 billion people and so people have a very different um, response to population because it's just so massive that you can't possibly you have to create these little bubbles of community because you can't you just can't deal with that those numbers it's just too immense for anyone to cope with even you know trump or somebody like that just can't so i don't know i think we have to really start considering these kinds of questions because politically they're really important we you know we're for to take our marginalized politics of sort of an ecological politics of listening and then somehow turn it into a way of life across the planet how do you do that i'm not sure but i think we need to I totally agree, Ruth. I mean, I've got a little seed of an idea about that, that it's, yeah, it's about making those connections at the small scale, like through our local connections and then connecting like this to like-minded people in, in other localities. And I really resonate with what you're saying about that because I think of Cambridge Analytica and how, you know, they, they used algorithms and advertising as a way of, of um, slanting even left-wing voters towards voting for Trump. And it, it is a bit insidious, the spaces, you know, the, the, um, how they're being taken over. Um, and we don't have a lot of control over what we're seeing and hearing. It's all being filtered, you know, through, um, through this sort of machine learning, um, which, is, which is scary, um, you know, so how do you sort of, raise up above that um, you know that's a question um that i i don't have an answer for but you're right i, I totally agree with what what you're saying mm. someone's saying return to ef schumacher small is beautiful mm -hmm. could i say something on the um the, the political activism side um i've done a bit of work with get up and one of the tactics that they use pre-elections where you call sort of people in electorates say like Tony Abbott's electorate is you phone call them and sort of the first introduction that you do is sort of based on mutual value values so rather than like attacking them for say 
being a liberal supporter, you find the value that makes them a liberal supporter, which is perhaps say like um, the idea of family and like family is really important. And then link that value back into why that will be affected by climate change or wh whatever the issue is. Um, but yeah, bringing it back down to values rather than jumping to like political labeling. Yeah. Great point, Nina. Uh, and it's interesting, we're having our local election in the Australian Capital Territory and, um, you know, the, there's been a lot of tree planting projects and, and also a lot of campaigns. And the, the Conservatives have got signs saying, one million trees. <laughs> so even the sort of boundaries are becoming increasingly blurry. But I agree, it's, it's about um, uh, the value proposition and connecting to people from where they are and what's important to them when you just want to mm. yell at them for whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a difference between hearing and listening. I mean, hearing, you're just hearing, but you're not actually taking it in and you're not actually fully understanding. And I think that's, we need to kind of create a space where people can come together to hear each other, to listen to each other and understand, not necessarily to agree, but to understand another perspective. And from that space, then we can move forward. You know, I think that's a, a beautiful um, point maybe, Joe, to, to maybe, you know, sort of close the conversation if there's no other questions, because it's about 25 past eight, which means it's almost half past 10 in New Zealand. Um, and I'm normally snoozing at this time. <laughs> oh, no. um, before we close, um, I think we're going to go back to Andrew just to, to finish uh, and, and wrap it up. But look, I just want to thank everybody. Um, thank you to all the panellists for your generosity in sharing your stories and, and having this conversation. and. Thank you to Soundwalk September as well um, for inviting me to, to come forward with the panel and also big thanks to Tracy Cooper from the Valley Centre uh, and um, Michelle Maloney from Alia uh, for hosting and thank you to all the participants as well. It was lovely to see um, all your faces. Uh, Tracy Cooper, do you have any last words before we hand over to Andrew? Just a, a many thanks and just great to listen to the depth of, um, I guess, artistic intimacy and wanting to connect across the globe, across different disciplines. And this is the future, isn't it? Um, this sacred space, listening to the depth of our own hearts and the heart of nature. So thanks for, for inviting me to, to host and, uh, Listen in, it's been wonderful, thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Andrew, take it away. <laughs> okay, well, very quickly, just to say that uh, obviously there are other events going, uh, taking place uh, during the month. Um, uh, some might not be very convenient for those in the Southern Hemisphere, but we hope that you can join in in some way. Uh, we, we, we are now taking on a policy that if you buy a ticket, we'll let you have a recording of any event that takes place. But we know from what Leah's told us that uh, a recorded experience is nothing like as great as a live one. Um, anyway, uh, thanks to everyone who's contributed to this. Uh, I think it's been a really fabulous discussion. And um, this is where I say thank you to our Australian sponsors, uh, Sound Trails, who once again, if I remind you, they're a leading locative platform uh, based in Australia. And you can check them out at uh, soundtrails.com.au. But thank you very much everyone for uh, contributing to Soundwalk September. And we hope our, our paths will cross again. We'll see you again on a video conference call very soon. <laughs>